All righty. Hello, everyone online and in person. Thank you all so much for um, coming and attending. Uh, I know that some people will be trickling in online. Just a reminder, um, we have uh, we have the opportunity to add your questions online in the Q&A. Um, so if you have your questions throughout the talk, uh, we'll, we'll answer them in the end. So please go ahead and enter them in there. Uh, it's also great for those of you online to say where you're attending from. So we have an idea of kind of where everyone is um, uh, attending in from around the world. Uh, I'm really excited this week to be hosting Chris Chris and uh, Chris Wilson is a professor at the agro in the agronomy department at the University of Florida. We actually got put in touch through our common uh, postdoc advisor, Mike Strickland. I'm particularly excited about the work that Chris does because I think that it really kind of straddles this line of truly great questions about ecology, the idea of nutrient cycling, how does our soil and plant systems work, but then it has this really in impressive applied system where he's answering questions in agronomy in areas of crop science that I think are going to take these important ecological questions and apply them to systems that hopefully create more sustainable um, understanding of how to, to continue our agricultural system. So I'm really appreciative that he came up, he gets to enjoy finally some sun in the Hudson Valley. And uh, without further ado, please take it away. All right, are we good mic wise? Great. All right, well, thanks very much for that very nice introduction and thank you all for hosting me here at Cary. You all have a very beautiful campus. It's been really nice to spend a few days here and get to explore the, explore the area. So I'm gonna to talk to you today. Uh, my talk is called As Above, So Below, Managing Pastures for Ecosystem Services, Both Above and Below Ground. And being from an agronomy department, Y'all are probably expecting me to tell you some corny jokes. So I just did, anyway, <laughs> dad humor, right? Okay, so general overview of what we're doing today. Um, in the first part, I'm gonna provide kind of a general framework for how I think about climate change, how that interfaces with agriculture and grasslands. The second part, it's gonna be on the theme of putting carbon into the soil. And then the third part, we're gonna talk about the general challenges of scaling up. And I want to note that a lot of what I'm going to talk about <clears throat> that's our own original work has more of the flavor of work in progress than polished answers at this point. So uh, hopefully intended to just stimulate some discussion, conversation, perhaps even some lively debate. I welcome all of that. Okay, so the big picture context of what motivates me the most in terms of my work and as a human being alive in 2022 is the issue of climate change or really the climate crisis. And I'm not gonna belabor the origin nature of this crisis, except to point out that it is probably the largest existential risk that we've had to deal with as a species. Although, you know, current situations in certain parts of the world remind us that we didn't deal with things like nuclear threat either. But on a day-to-day -day basis, personally, I think a lot more about climate change. Um, I also think about it a lot so on this right-hand side here is a picture of my son, Silas. This was taken over two years ago. It's amazing how fast kids grow up. And that gives you that sense that the future has this way of becoming the present. And when we talk about climate change, it's often like these discussions about what's gonna be like in 2050 or 2100. And oftentimes that's felt very remote, like particularly when I was in high school or an undergrad, um, you know, those dates seem like far in the future. Well, 2050, I hope I'm still alive and kicking. And 2100, my son has a very good chance of being alive. And so a lot of this boils down to, I need a better future for him. So thinking about what that would look like. So this figure here on the left, this comes from, this was a special report the IPCC did a few years ago, talking about the pathways to 1.5 C of warming. So what's shown here is basically the total emissions that would be consistent with keeping warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so to do that, you see, we need to basically already be at peak emissions. We've got a little bit of leeway on some of the trajectories here to get our act together. And then we've got to start 
on an ambitious global coordinated campaign to reduce those emissions considerably. And we got to get to zero, not net zero, but real zero by mid-century, and then we go negative, right? So there's this rapid drawdown that has to happen, and then we have to sequester and actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. And these are going to have to happen in tandem, of course, but uh, the net effect is we actually need to undo some of that legacy that we've already put up there. So in thinking about this, then what's the possible role that agriculture might play in this? So I really like this figure. I've used it a ton over the years. What this shows is the global distribution of cropland and what they call pasture land, although I would just call it gra grazing lands in general. A lot of this is more rangeland than pasture, but that's the kind of distinction that I like to draw as in an agronomy department. Anyways, um, if we add all this stuff up, we're talking about 14% of ice-free terrestrial land area for croplands. And then we're talking about 24% roughly for the pasture grasslands of the world. So that's nearly 40% of the ice-free terrestrial land area that's under fairly intensive management to meet human needs. So it's a lot, it's, it's actually a very similar fraction of the global NPP that we're basically harnessing to feed ourselves and to feed our civilization. So it should be sort of intuitive that the way that we choose to do that is likely to have a big impact on the global carbon cycle. Unfortunately, for those of us who really love agriculture, most of the legacy of ag has not been a good one from a global carbon point of view. So in general, agriculture has been in the business of mining carbon in the soil or removing carbon and putting it back to the atmosphere through clearing forests. So a lot of you know a lot more about that than I do. Um, loss of woody biomass, right? You're converting forest land into either annual crops or pasture for that matter. You're losing all the carbon that's held up in the tree biomass. There's also a profound loss in soil organic carbon that just happens when you convert any perennial ecosystem into an annual ecosystem and do cropping on it. And so in that context, I really like this picture from the Land Institute. Up here on the top left, this shows a seasonal progression uh, where we are comparing perennial wheat, Kernza. Um, this is a cultivar they've actually recently licensed and released under the Cascadian Farms brand. So you can actually buy cereal with Kernza grain in it. It's kind of cool. Um, what, what really is intended to strike you here is the difference in the root biomass between this annual wheat plant and the perennial plants right next to it. Even at peak biomass accumulation, the annual wheat can't hold a candle to the perennial deep-rooted prairie species. And so that has tremendous impact on soil quality, the ability to resist soil erosion, right? So wholesale conversion of the Great Plains tallgrass prairie combined with climatic cycles of drought led to things like the Dust Bowl, right? Huge parts of American history. We we're sailing into an era where stuff like that is kind of, I think, back on the table. Other factors, of course, intensive tillage, enrichment of nutrient cycles, all those things can help stimulate decomposition, increase losses of carbon back to the atmosphere. And then in general, in the pasture land and the rangelands of the world, mismanagement of grazing. So either overstocking or in some cases understocking, usually the problem is overstocking or not respecting kind of the natural grazing patterns that uh, help keep grasslands intact and healthy. So what can agriculture do to be part of the solution given all that? Um, one way to think about this is if we can constrain what the total losses have been, then we can kind of reverse engineer what's likely to be the upper ceiling or some kind of potential for drawdown or sequestration. If we're starting now is the baseline and then looking into the future. So if we try to look at the historic soil organic carbon losses, we're talking Lau at Ohio State University is done a lot of the most prominent work in this area. We're talking about close to 80 petagrams of carbon, it's 80 billion metric tons. That's worth about 40 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's conceivably, we could reverse all that if we were able to scale up what I'll broadly call regenerative practices, things that can rebuild soil organic matter and replenish that carbon in the soil. If we want to express all this instead on an annual basis and think about annual sequestration potentials, um, Lal has estimated we're talking somewhere between a half and one petagram of carbon per year. So we put all that together, 
we're looking at up to 15% of current emissions. So right away, this should tell you this is likely to be, you know, a perhaps a meaningful wedge in this process. But of course, we're not going to carbon farm our way out of climate change. So there are a lot of people who promote some irresponsible numbers, in my opinion, that imply that we can, we can just kind of sequester our carbon into our soils and get around climate change that way. I don't think so. In pastures particularly, there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, in general, I think across ecosystems, it's those root systems that are responsible for the lion's share of the soil organic matter um, that, that we see where that carbon actually originates. Although perhaps we can have some lively debate about that in the context of forests, I think I will admit a little bit more ignorance in that context. Um, in grasslands, at least, there's two kind of primary reasons why I think this is the case for the most part. The first is that they do a large proportional amount of their biomass production below ground. So we saw those pictures of the enormous root systems of those kernza plants. This is a picture of Bahia grass. This is a porridge I'm going to talk more about today that I work with a lot, kind of showing its root system in a pasture that from South Florida. If you are going to survive as a grass in a system where you are subject to repeated defoliation from grazies, ruminant animals, and if you're not grazing it, what's most likely to happen is a fire is going to come through and remove your leaf area that way, you need to sustain a really large active surface area of roots that are ready to pull nutrients and water out of the soil and get that leaf area back and growing as quickly as possible. So. I think in our systems, it may be as high as 70% of the total NPP is happening below ground. Now, what this then does is you've got this large biomass of roots hanging out in the soil, and then they get old, they senesce, they die, and they turn over. That's a big input of carbon into the soil. And then there's also a large rhizodeposition flux. So it turns out that living roots are also constantly exuding sugars, amino acids, organic acids, uh, mucilages, things like that, right into the rhizosphere. Those play a big important role in the rhizospheric uh, microbial ecology, the kind of the, the flux of respiration coming from soils and potentially for a long-term buildup of soil organic carbon. And as I said, all this, all your above ground input potentials in pastures are susceptible to losses, either grazing or fire. So, in general, what I think about kind of the promises for carbon farming ideas in pasture, overall, I think we do have a large potential to build soil organic matter with perennial pasture systems. This has been a long established kind of fact of experience it's due to those root systems that, that develop. And you see a lot of this like convention, like traditional wisdom and practices like lay farming where people would rotate annual crops with a perennial crop phase to replenish, rebuild the soil, uh, get the fertility back up, and then you convert it back into annual crops. We've done some work at the uh, University of Florida showing that a sod-based rotation where you get two years of bahia grass in between two years of you know, agronomic row crops, you see a consistent yield benefit to those annual crops coming out of the grass rotation that you can't explain just through nutrient supply. We've matched fertilizer inputs and that. So there's a lot of potential for these uh, pastures to play an important role in our agriculture. All that potential though is sensitive to their management. And so there's this general toolkit to think about for kind of understanding how we manage pastures. The first thing, the most obvious one is how is the grazing itself managed? So on the left here, this is a picture um, from Jim Garish's ranch in Idaho. So this is a landscape that Jane's very familiar with. Very pretty. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go out there, they get a lot of this kind of uh, valley bottom pasture land. And then you've got rangelands going up onto the mountain sides. What you see here is a bunch of cattle that are kind of tightly herded together. This is he's one of these thought leaders in this whole management intensive grazing field. And so the idea is to be very careful and precise, matching your stocking rates to the pasture production capacity, managing the timing, intensity, and duration of the grazing so that you get adequate rest periods to optimize plant growth and nutritive quality and basically help all the ecosystem benefits flow from that. Um, pasture plant composition is another important aspect of management. 
So a big example of that would be, do you just have a grassy graminoid pasture or are you also like adding legumes into that? That functional complementarity between grass and legumes appears to be very important for ecosystem services, especially so with C4 grasses. And then of course, um, nutrient management with fertilization, um, organic amendments, anything like that. So let's take a quick look at some global synthesis data. What do these practices seem to translate into in terms of carbon sequestration rate benefits? So like what would be the additional benefit of improving pasture management in these different ways? So we can see that um, fertilization, improved grazing, and to an extent sowing legumes are kind of the best studied of that toolkit. Some things like earthworms seem very exciting, but this is an N equals two, so I wouldn't put a huge amount of stock in that right now. Um, basically, we're talking about somewhere between a quarter and maybe a half metric tons of carbon per hectare per year. I'll provide you a little bit more context for that um, shortly, what that would actually mean in practice. Uh, but one thing I did want to point out is that this factor here, land use conversion from ag, is the largest. So this is about three quarters, and I think it can actually be much higher than that in some cases. What that's referring to is that whole practice of you've got annual cropland, it's probably depleted, so organic matter to a certain extent. And then what's just the benefit of converting that into any kind of pasture? whether it's managed good, bad, or indifferently. Okay, the other thing I wanted to say is that, um, and this is what we see here at McSherry and Ritchie's uh, meta-analysis kind of review of grazing management impacts on soil organic carbon. What they found was this deep contextuality and interaction between the type of photosystem in the plants and their response to grazing intensity. So they found that in the C3 pasture, as you increased your grazing intensity, that was associated with a decline in the soil organic carbon stock, whereas in C4 pasture, it was associated with an increase. And so like all these things in the natural world, when we try to assess the impact of one tool in our toolkit or one practice, we have to be aware that context always matters. So what do these numbers really mean for carbon farming potential? Um, if we kind of summarize and synthesize across them, I think that on a lot of pasture land, the range of possible improvements we might be able to expect is somewhere between a half and two metric tons of carbon per hectare per year. If we scale that up, and this is one of these kind of back of the envelope, admittedly extremely naive, but gives us a ballpark way to start reasoning about this. If we were to scale up a midpoint estimate of around one ton per hectare per year, across our roughly 240 million hectares of grazing land in the United States. That's worth around a quarter of a pentagram per year of carbon, which is roughly 17% of our emissions. So actually it's a little weird how that worked out to be kind of similar to the, the global um, figures that I showed from Rotan Lal. What about from the producer point of view? Well, getting paid uh, could uh, incentivize adoption of these practices. And a lot of that's going to depend on how much we're paying. So if you've got some kind of carbon offset market, admittedly, a lot of them, I think, are priced way too low right now. So you get like maybe $20 a ton, something like that. That seems really low. Like, okay, maybe just 20 extra dollars per hectare. But the thing to keep in mind, particularly with pasture, is that these tend to be low margin enterprises per unit area. So the total profit margin on an acre of land is pretty small to begin with. So actually, even relatively modest carbon payments uh, might be of interest to some folks. For that reason, there is a very real and growing demand to quantify this and other ecosystem services. I've gotten several emails and calls from people that are like, hey, what's going on with carbon sequestration, carbon offsets? How do we tap into this? Like, what do we need to do to show, like verify that sequestration is happening and all this stuff? And unfortunately, my answer is, uh, you're asking the wrong person because I'm going to tell you that it's difficult and it depends um, for a variety of reasons. So first of all, anything below ground is hard to measure kind of by default, right? Um, and so if you have to rely on consistent field sampling of soil cores, getting adequate spatial coverage at the temporal frequency that you need, it's going to be logistically pretty challenging. There's just a lot of variability in the real world spatial and temporal variations in the rates of carbon input 
and also heterogeneity in the soils themselves. So there's heterogeneity in the soil microbial communities and their physiological you know, responses. Those are what are actually responsible both for decomposition of organic matter, as well as for synthesis of compounds that ironically end up contributing to the buildup of long-term carbon in the soil. And there's a lot of heterogeneity in the soil's basic ability to stabilize organic matter and carbon. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about how that works today, but basically it's sort of linked to the total amount of charged mineral surface area. So the amount of nutrient holding capacity and things like that, sort of related to how much carbon you can stabilize. All that is very heterogeneous. And then we just have this fact in the natural world, interactions and contexts are the default, especially anything to do with biology or any higher levels of organization like ecosystems built on top of that. Okay, so part two, uh, putting carbon into the soil. Basically, we've got three research questions that our work has been kind of organized around. First is how does that toolkit of pasture management, so grazing management, functional composition of the plants and nutrients, how does that really impact root production, below ground carbon allocation and soil organic carbon in Florida pasture specifically? Do the impacts on forage production and quality, otherwise what we see above ground, track or predict the impacts on what we see happening below ground in the root soil system? In other words, will managing for forage and animal production in some sense, does it necessarily have to trade off with our ability to deliver below ground ecosystem services? So before I jump a little further into that, I just wanted to introduce a little bit more of this idea of grazing lands in Florida. So how many of you all before today were familiar with the idea that ranching might be a thing in Florida? Okay, yeah, you guys are ecosystem people, so you're, you're tuned in, that's really good. Okay, uh, a lot of people just think about Florida, you think about beaches, hurricanes, Disney, uh, maybe the Everglades, something like that. We have a lot of rural agricultural land use, and among those land uses, ranching is one of the major ones, kind of right behind pine forestry in terms of land area. Um, a lot of this is concentrated in the central spine of the state, and particularly so in South Central Florida, just north of Lake Okeechobee. So we have a subtropical climate and correspondingly subtropical set of forages. Looks a lot different than the pastures up here. I grew up in Michigan and spent time in uh, Massachusetts and Vermont, very familiar with temperate pasture. Florida pasture is a lot different. So C4 uh, grasses, but they're mostly planted, introduced species like bahia grass, Bermuda grass, Although we do have some cool remnant areas of kind of more or less native prairie, uh, particularly in this part of South Central Florida um, with composition that's actually pretty similar to tall grass prairie in many places, uh, with Indian grass, big blue stem, things like that. What the actual ranch lands are used for primarily is cow calf production. So unlike New York and Vermont, we all do a lot of dairy. This is uh, mostly beef cattle, although we do have uh, not trivial dairy sector as well. Um, the beef cattle production cow calf basically means that uh, we've got brood cows that are out on the landscape. They reproduce, their calves grow up, they wean them, and then sometime after weaning, they're sold generally to feedlots in the Midwest or the Southern Plains, a lot closer to the grain supply of this country for uh, kind of obvious reasons. Landscape scale conservation, another just kind of interesting sidelight on the role of ran ranching in Florida is that we have a lot of growing push to do what's called this um, Florida Wildlife Corridor. And it involves a lot of agencies and kind of private groups working together, trying to promote like landscape connectivity and contiguity between uh, natural habitats, like connecting the Everglades, the Ocala National Forest, things like that. And there's this matrix of land uses of which Ranching is actually pretty wildlife and biodiversity friendly, it turns out. So there's kind of a matrix quality um, component to which, which it's contributing to. Any cop, anyway. So um, we did some work looking at the impacts of grazing on below ground processes. This was a few years ago now. We actually did this in the context of long-term grazing exposures at a ranch in South Florida called Buck Island Ranch. So these had been up for around 15 years when we did this experiment back in 2016, 2017. And basically, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the experiment in a second, but you can see inside the exposure here, there's a lot of secondary succession that's gone on. So the 
experimental manipulation here is start with actively grazed pasture as the baseline and then fence and exclude the grazers let the plant community kind of adjust itself and sort of see what happens we did a pulse chase experiment because we were interested in capturing root exudation and microbial responses using 13c uh, and we actually matched to remnant grass patches inside the exposure versus outside but there was still pretty large phenotypic shifts in the structure of the plants any case, with all that kind of in mind, we did see a much higher root biomass and correspondingly root exudation rates in the actively grazed pasture as opposed to the excluded pasture. It's pretty large effect sizes, similar for microbial biomass. And then going along with all that, we saw about 25% higher soil organic carbon. So in this system, in this context, at least, it looks like the presence of grazing activity is actively promoting this shift to promoting allocation below ground and the kind of the resulting with resulting impacts on the organic matter stocks. Limitation here is that this is a very long term dichotomous grazing contrasts. It's a pretty extreme manipulation. It doesn't necessarily tell us what happens with variations in grazing management within still actively grazed pasture. One thing that we speculated coming out of this is can the impact of pasture management on SOC be predicted simply by tracking root biomass root system responses, because it'd be kind of nice if we could use that as sort of like a leading indicator um, and simplify some things for us. So we had a suite of new questions to address to build on that. We were interested in the impact of those other management factors like composition. In our case, we were interested in legume incorporation into C4 grass pasture. For a variety of reasons, this has been challenging in our subtropical context, but we do have some good candidates that have come out of breeding programs at UF um, focused on perennial peanut um, as a warm season. It's C3, but it's warm season uh, perennial legume, and it can hold its own in terms of competitive dynamics with the grasses and also stand up to hang and grazing pretty well. Also interested in nutrient enrichment and then in interactions of those two with defoliation. And then also just trying to get a more broader sense of the environmental context with seasonality, soil moisture. Do those things kind of mediate any of these effects? So broadly, how do management impacts compare above versus below ground? And do treatments that enhance root production lead to increased soil organic carbon? To address all this, um, we have this system of long-term pasture plots that we set up uh, using a very classic agronomic design, randomized complete block to split plot. Um, our whole plot factor is we've got two vegetation compositions, basically the grass, the grass plus the legume. And then we split the plots with uh, a clipping treatment. So just to diagram this, UC is unclipped control, nothing's added to it. C is monthly clipping. So we clip and remove that biomass. We uh, measure that to get kind of productivity, but that biomass is actually removed from the system. And then the CM is we were adding manure back after clipping. So it ends up being a semi-factorial design. In this experiment, we measure a whole bunch of stuff, forage production, nutrients, um, canopy leaf area and a bunch of like ecophysiological structure stuff that'll be um, I'll touch on why we did that later and then root dynamics um, and other soil properties that were measured the root production and turnover in this case we're measuring with the mini rhizotron system and I'll just talk briefly about that it's a very painstaking method gives you some cool data but it, it's a ton of work um, so basically PVC tubes go into the ground at a 45 degree angle. You get a transparent kind of like strip that allows like these little viewing ports on them. And basically you put a camera that's specifically designed to go down those tubes. And you can see these red dots here are where it clips in successively. And so we get in our one meter by one meter plots, we can get about half a meter of depth um, after accounting for that 45 degree angle. And then we get a whole bunch, like roughly 50 one centimeter by one centimeter images that are very fine scale, like root soil interface images. So it ended up being quite a lot. So we did this on 24 um, tubes monthly. Let's see how this adds up. We've got tens of thousands of images now. What do they actually look like? Um, so this is a comparison of two frames over time. So across from, this is what it looked like in April. This is now what it looks like in May. Here's what it looks like in June. Each of the individual roots has to be hand digitized. 
right now, and then we ID them, give them individual IDs, and that allows us to kind of track them over time. So we can take kind of almost like a population ecological approach. We're studying like cohorts of roots as they grow, and then they get old and senesce and turn over and go away. Um, a lot of other things that I could potentially talk about. Let's do that after the talk. Um, this is another image just kind of showing how that changes over time. Um, we are working to try to automate this with algorithms with some machine learning colleagues that progress cannot come fast enough, in my opinion. So we have basically one full uh, year worth of data at this point where we've got everything nicely digitized, ID tracked to where we could partition out gross production from turnover. I'm only going to focus on production today. Um, and basically here are the patterns that we found. Um, root production appears to be concentrated in late spring and early summer for us. Um, and just to orient you to the graph on the top, we've got the grass um, plots, and then these are the plots where we have grass plus the legume. These are our three clipping and then the clipping plus manure addition treatments. These are means and standard errors, and there's just a ton of variability in these data. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in like, oh, this month, maybe this is a significant difference. Like I, I'd be very cautious, but essentially none of these treatment effects appear to do anything to root production, surprisingly enough to me. Um, we did see the seasonal pattern and we do see a compositional thing whereby the grass plots are producing more and their peak is much higher than the grass plus the legume plots. So my question for you all to ponder, uh, keep in the back of your mind is, does this then lead to more soil organic carbon kind of per our thought process or hypothesis at the beginning? What's happening above ground? Again, this is just this year. Um, we've got about four years and I can tell you that the above ground patterns, again, there's lots of interaction with weather patterns and climate uh, that, that plays out and other factors we're still um, exploring basically, but to just to match it to those root production data we're just showing from that year. Um, essentially in green here, this is the annual summed forage production in terms of grams dry matter per meter squared. In green is our grass only. And then in brown, we've got the grass plus the legume. So overall we see clipping tends to stimulate our forage production. This is a kind of overcompensation response. We've seen this before. Um, Particularly grazing adapted C4 plants seem to do this. They, they kind of like to be beat up a little bit, it seems. Um, there's some interesting ecophysiology behind that uh, that we could talk about later. In terms of the treatment effect with the nutrients, basically we see that it looks like the <clears throat> peanut plots are able to get a little bit of residual benefit from that manure addition that we did not see in the grass plots. My hypothesis about that is that the legume the plots with the legumes are no longer as nitrogen limited. So they're able to take advantage of some of the non-nitrogen related benefits of the manure application. In terms of the seasonal distribution, in contrast to the roots, we see in this year, it actually peaked of forage production in September. And it was kind of like consistently growing up and then peaking there and then falling off considerably as our days get cooler, which they do do in Florida. And then with photo period responses too. Real quick, um, if we try to match these things spatially, so we look at, at an individual plot for an individual month, we're plotting up the forage production versus the root production that's observed. Um, it doesn't really matter if you plot this month by month or some over the whole season, you get the same result, which is essentially nothing. It's a flat, statistically meaningless relationship. So there's no close correlation that we can suss out there linking the above and the below ground. This is actually consistent with some stuff we published last year uh, from a similar kind of experiment where we were looking at variations in defoliation management across Bahia grass cultivars. We tried to predict root production observed with in-growth cores in that case, based on the shoot production. And again, basically not happening. All right, so let's go back impact on the um, soil organic carbon pools. Um, for right now, I'm just expressing these as percent SOC. We do have some bulk density data that we are doing some QA QC on. Uh, next time I'll be able to talk about soil organic carbon stocks. Um, but for right now, we've got the percentages here. If we look across between Bahia and mixed, um, there's really not much going on there. And in general, there's a lot less going on than, than one might expect. These soils were collected at the end of 2021. So this is basically after 
five to six years of treatment imposition at this point. So we thought that that would be enough time to kind of see some things emerging. The only thing that really stands out is this potential relationship here where the clipped grass plots look like they're actually showing a little bit of a decline in their concentration of carbon. We don't see that in the mixed plots. And then it looks like where we are replenishing with nutrients, flipping and then adding nutrients, whether manure or fertilizer, we don't see that as well. So I, I suspect what might be going on here, if this is real and this holds up over time, is that we're basically de depleting the nitrogen pool by clipping and removing that biomass consistently. And we're actually revealing kind of an underlying long-term dependence on the nitrogen cycle for our kind of soil, soil organic matter stock. Overall, right now, it looks like the soil organic carbon forage and reproduction are all only pretty weakly coupled, but we're still investigating that in a few different ways. This kind of links another possible thing going on here is that you know this site's been in perennial pasture for quite a while. We did some disturbance when we installed and in introduced the peanut, uh, but we could be pretty close to some idea of saturation. And basically, the idea here is we, we may not be able to store additional carbon indefinitely. Uh, although Jane and I were having a great conversation about this topic yesterday, there's even more nuances than what I put here. Um, anyhow, the basic idea is you know, you can see here's some data from uh, Stuart et al. This is combining 14 different agroecosystem studies, and then they matched carbon input rates to resulting observations of organic carbon. And you see the response you kind of expect across biology and life sciences. You get this saturating response to a driver, right? So you're not get, you can't ad infinitum increase your soil organic carbon. Likewise, in time, as you shift your management practices, what we expect is an initial period of a very rapid buildup, and then that will slow down and stabilize over time. I bring this up in large part because if we wanna go back to thinking real quick about payment schemes, this idea of carbon farming and incentivizing adoption of practices, how we approach this will have an impact. So if we are doing carbon offsets where you have to demonstrate net increases to get paid for your carbon credits, what that's really doing is incentivizing the adoption of a practice, because that's that initial phase, you're gonna see a big steep response. If you want to incentivize maintenance of that stock, you need some other kind of payment scheme. You're, you kind of wanna pay people to sort of maintain something or maintain a practice that they're already doing. And that basically to me sounds a lot like reinventing the idea of a best management practice by some other name. So I think there's some interesting issues to talk about with how we think about carbon credits, carbon markets versus BMPs and approach that whole business. The thing I worry about a little bit, if we don't get that right, is some perverse incentives to perhaps uh, game the system a little bit by enrolling your land, doing all your practices, unenrolling it, bringing out your carbon farming uh, bottom plow, burning off some carbon for a while, <laughs> then re-enrolling when you can convert it back to grass. And then that's, that's not what we want. Anyways, um, overall takeaways, apparently some weak coupling and root and forage production. This replicates previous findings in similar pasture. Uh, overall, the management seems to have surprisingly little impact on root production, although we do see the grass pasture clearly outproducing the grass plus legume. Uh, we, we see a sign or a trend at least right now for the soil organic carbon to decline under defoliation, but only if we're not replenishing nutrients. Okay. So with that, we're gonna to go to the third part of my talk today. This is gonna be addressing this general challenge of scaling up. And so another subtitle here is pastures from space. So the basic issue that we're thinking about here is that ultimately we are concerned with how to monitor and manage across very large, surprisingly heterogeneous landscapes. So in the middle here, this is an image of that, that Buck Island Ranch where we um, used the exclosures to do that study a few years ago. It turns out it's an 11,000 acre cow-calf ranch. You've got planted pasture, you've got semi-native pastures, you've got um, hundreds of these seasonal uh, depressional wetlands, you've got lots of patches of forest, tons of variation, soil moisture, all this stuff. 
lots of heterogeneity. And what we're learning is really all this stuff coming out of plot scale research, right? And it's, we can't do that kind of traditional field work at those scales. So what we need is basically what is scalable, right? So some things are satellite remote sensing is scalable. Soil and elevational data is scalable as is you can get pretty good met data from like gridded out met data products now. It's pretty amazing the kind of data that you can find. And all this kind of goes under this enthusiasm for so-called big data. Just as a little proof of principle, um, several years ago, we did a study across Buck Island um, indexing solar organic carbon stocks at 60 different locations. And we found that a sufficiently long time series of the EVI, Enhanced Vegetation Index, it's basically an index of greenness, helped us to statistically explain the spatial variations in the SOC that we observed. We couldn't give you pretty good mechanisms for that, but it, it, it was very robust in itself. What we're really trying to do then is to need develop models that can take insights from our plot research and then scale them more dynamically with these other kinds of data to understand the systems a bit better. And so just <clears throat> real briefly here, um, in the big picture, we want to look both above and below ground in this kind of enterprise. But what we've started with is basically the above ground portion, that forage growth. Um, we thought that was a pretty logical starting point because one, producers care most directly about it for obvious reasons. Another thing is just ecophysiological rationale. Ultimately, <clears throat> your assimilation of carbon out of the atmosphere is happening in the canopy. It's happening with photosynthesis. So it does indeed set kind of some kind of ceiling on what can go below ground. So the first part of this project was basically to figure out how well can we estimate pasture biomass and quality using only spectral data from the Sentinel-2 satellite. So this is a satellite platform operated by the European Space Agency. It's available on like Google Earth Engine. You can get it graded out. What we did was, um, this is a, a big, core of one of my PhD student Hunter Smith's dissertation. Um, basically, he set up uh, an experiment at, at our site outside of Gainesville, Florida, where he has these um, 30 meter by 30 meter plots that are aligned with the Sentinel-2 pixels. So we got them perfectly lined up with, with GIS equipment. And then we defoliated them in a lagged pattern so that each time the satellite would fly over the site and get an image, we would have a nice gradient of biomass, give us the best chance to then build statistical learning models that can help predict that biomass using the spectral data. So he spent quite a long time throwing a lot of different statistical and machine learning approaches at this. We're sort of finally getting to some good synthesis of that. This is just one of several approaches that are roughly comparable in their performance in terms of out of sample validation. And it shows what we can expect, I think, from this kind of an approach. We get an overall a decent R squared. We see a little bit of a, of a drift here where we're sort of missing some of the higher biomass accumulations. Uh, but overall, it's not too bad. We get a root mean squared error of around 750 kilograms per hectare. Um, this is probably good enough to at least get started helping inform producers who are managing at the scale of thousands of acres, and they can't go out you know, even visually and get a sense of what's out there. What does it look like? So he's building up a product to return to our um, rancher partner uh, for this particular project. It's going to look something like this, the ability to map out their management units and then use the model predictions for the biomass. So we're just showing essentially a heat map style here where the darker red is the higher biomass accumulation, the darker green is the lower biomass accumulation. So it's pretty good, pretty cool for what it is. There are several caveats with this as it is, however. First, generalizing site to site is something we're still a little concerned about. We don't fully know how much calibration you need to do on any individual site. And I think that this is one of the potential dirty secrets of this whole field that people don't like to talk about enough. And I may get in trouble for saying that, but that's what I think. There's also lots of cloud cover, and you can kind of see that in some of these things have like the sort of Swiss cheese effect going on in them. Some of that was due to exclusion, but some of that was cloud cover. This is a big problem 
in Florida, and I suspect through much of the eastern U.S., where we get a lot of rain, and particularly so during the growing season that we care the most about, right? It's a lot of abundance and growth happening in summer because there's a lot of rainfall, but that means there's clouds, so the satellites can't see what you want them to see. Combine that with the revisit frequency of the satellites, and basically we could be missing a lot of data. Lastly, this is just giving you sequences of static images, and you don't necessarily get any inherent insight from that. So just real briefly, um, the remainder of time here, this is the kind of context I'm a big fan of thinking using process-based models. And so the basic idea here is that even when the satellite data are not available, if we have a robust process-based kind of crop model underneath everything, we can use that to estimate and forecast, and that can build in our scientific knowledge, like we do know a lot about the stand ecophysiology, can build in, it can assimilate previous imagery and historical kind of baselines, management details, and it can use all of the consistently available environmental data, like light, temperature, rainfall, things like that. So the framework we've been using is what's called an RUE, or radiation use efficiency model. And basically what this is, is it evolves the canopy leaf area over time. That's this uh, differential term here on the left as a function of the incoming light, the photosynthetically active light, the amount of that that gets absorbed, which is a function of that leaf area index. The higher your leaf area, the more you're gonna absorb the incoming light. You multiply all that by the radiation use efficiency. And this whole set of terms here gives you your, your new production of leaf area. And you can express this as either leaf area or biomass uh, or interconvert them, however. And then we're tacking on a turnover term for senescence. RUE is one of these concepts that seems too good to be true, but it's actually very robust. It works pretty well at the stand level. It's sort of an emergent property of stands. Uh, just to illustrate this, here is data from four different peanut cultivars showing their accumulation of absorbed radiation on the x-axis and their biomass on the y-axis. And you can see it's basically a linear relationship. The slope of that line is your radiation use efficiency. So just to show you a little bit um, what this model looks like using some of our data, right now we're at kind of the proof of concept stage using plot level data. And we are, as we speak, working on how the, well this works, assimilating satellite data in, into it. But how it works for the plots, the way we set it up is we actually had on those rhizotron plots, periodic measurements of leaf area index using a LICOR canopy analyzer. And that those data are shown in these red and purple dots connected by corresponding line segments. So you get that kind of like saturating increase over your growing season. And then the model is basically fitting all of those terms using the LAI time series and a little bit of prior constraints on some of the parameters. And then we're pushing predictions out of the model. And that's what's shown underneath. So this blue line underneath is the mean of the predictive distribution. It's all being done in a, in a Bayesian framework. Um, and then we're showing different um, line segments that represent some of our posterior uncertainty around that prediction. Now, the thing about this is those purple points are actually holdouts. So I was evaluating the ability of the model to forecast three successively held out dates. So basically it was fitting only on this portion of the series and then predicting from there. And we see there's a lot of measurement variation. Lycoris device is pretty good, but it, there's a fair amount of measurement error. Um, and it overall performs pretty well. The other thing I was gonna point out about this is that it can partition and explain spatial variations in production. So some of these plots like this one here, only get up to a peak LAI like somewhat less than three, whereas others are getting up, you know, seven, eight, nine almost. And it's explaining those by variations in their radiation use efficiency. So we see this is kind of the mean and confidence intervals for those RUE estimates. Um, and we, we, when we compared those to turnover and some of the other parameters, the RUE was the most powerful explanatory variable. So that's neat because we've also been able to extend it by explaining variations in radiation use efficiency based on temperature, moisture, nutrient supply. And that's kind of the big picture here. So that's where we're gonna kind of funnel everything through uh, variations in those underlying parameters. All right, so just 
to wrap things up, we think we've got a promising framework for estimating and forecasting canopy dynamics and properties. We've linked this to some of the covariates drivers. Scaling up with the remote sensing data is, is in progress as we speak. And then we really need to start getting our hands around this below ground allocation piece next. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't know if that's even gonna be possible, but we'll try to try to link to some better models for soil organic carbon. And then that would be kind of the goal would be to link all these pieces together. We've got a forage model, we've got a below ground allocation model, and then that's talking to an SOC model. But by the way, the SOC model, he's got a lot of things to resolve there, like um, whether we're gonna use a first order framework or a microbial explicit framework, and what are the kind of experiments that we wanna do to calibrate and validate that framework for our sites. So my last slide here, and then at least a few minutes left, uh, will kind of bring us back to where we started. So we've got this, this big challenge here. We know basically what we have to do, got to slide down this curve really, really fast and then go negative. I think I really like this picture from Project Drawdown. I don't know how many of you all have followed their work. This was a little bit outdated. I'm not sure if uh, John Foley, who runs it now, likes this picture anymore. Uh, but I, I still like it because it shows this sense of just how many different things we can potentially put together to get this removal, this drawdown piece accomplished. And a lot of them involve our food system and our agricultural system. And so that's really what we have to do is we can't think about silver bullets. We've got to think about putting all of the pieces together. On the drawdown side here, th these curves, I mean, this seems like a super ambitious timeline and in some ways it is, but I'm actually more optimistic now than I've been in a long time because of the cost curves on renewables and storage. In a lot of cases, they're now beating out existing fossil fuel infrastructure. So I think this, the scientists and engineers behind that have bought us some additional time. But it's a bit like that scene in Indiana Jones when he's being chased by the ball, got to get through that door at the very end of the tunnel, and he jumps out and then slides the whip out at the last second and the door comes crashing down. I think the engineers have bought us a little bit of a lag in that door. So the question is, are we going to get out in time? Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really great. I mean, right, right up my alley. So uh, <laughs> I also really commend you for taking a crack at the carbon credit question, because I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And it, it's kind of overwhelming. Um, just a reminder, we have questions in the audience. Um, yep. If you can repeat those for those online, and then I will also um, take some online questions for you. But All right. uh, let's open Good. it up first to uh, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's a really good question. Um, I don't think that there's, oh, sorry. Yes. See, there I did, just jump right into it. The question is with respect to the figure showing carbon inputs increasing, and then there's a saturating response of an SOC. Why is it actually saturating as opposed to maybe like a linear relationship? I think that's actually a really good question. And it does highlight um, some of the underlying mechanisms that we still have uncertainty about. So in a, just to get a little bit technical, in a first order model framework like Century, Roth C, things like that, you would actually expect equilibrial stocks to be linearly proportional to your input rates. Unless you're also shifting turnover times as you're increasing your inputs. So that's one way you can kind of rescue that curve from a first order model. A microbial model implies many more complex dynamics are possible. So that's where you can get nonlinearities, feedbacks, and in microbial models in general, it turns out that your equilibrial stocks aren't direct functions of your inputs at all, which has been a thing that people have struggled wrapping their heads around with microbial models. 
but that's not right either because we did see there is some kind of relationship there. So I think it's just in general, it's a tricky question um, and happy to talk more afterwards about that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's just kind of a review, you know, meta analytic kind of approach. So it's across different experiments. So yeah, th that's a really good point. Thanks for bringing that up. The other possible answer here is there's too many other factors that are shifting around and perhaps we're confounded with with other site factors and things like that with that curve. Is it Mm. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, right? So can the difference between labile and recalcitrin explain explain that? Basically, yeah, potentially. And again, that would then go back to some of these fundamental questions about kind of model structure and uncertainty. So the role of labile carbon has recently been kind of um, revisited uh, in things like the MEMS framework, the microbial efficiency matrix stabilization hypothesis or framework, which says, oh, well, the labile carbon is actually the best way to promote microbial growth and proliferation. And we've got a good amount of evidence that microbial products and necromass is itself a large contributor to your long-term so carbon pools. So depending on the balance of those pathways in your system, you might get one or the other. So yeah, again, it's a good question and I don't know if there's a satisfying answer. Uh, I'm gonna take an online yep. question here. And uh, Steve Hamilton asks, have you tried a statistical power analysis to estimate your ability to detect a change in SOC against background spatial variability in your plots. <laughs> um, do I need to repeat that or are we good? Okay. <laughs> yes, that's a really good question. I actually, uh, yesterday was just thinking about that. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, we haven't done that yet. <laughs> so yes, we will be doing that, rest assured. Um, and that's part of why I was kind of couching that with some tentative nature with that conclusion. And and encouraging a little bit of caution and in interpreting that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, there'll be returns both from manure and then urine would be another through uric acid. Um, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head. I probably should. My guess is somewhere ballpark 60, 70%. Um, there'd be a certain amount. I mean, the, I think another important part of that is actually going to be not just how much flush is through the animal, like, but then what happens to it. Right. So even if a high proportion of it makes it through back into the manure, well, then what's happening to the manure? Right? Is that getting recycled back into the soil with like dung beetle activity? Um, you know, or is it sitting on the soil surface and volatilizing, you know, going off gassing as nitrous oxide? Things like that. What we were sorry, in those first two years when we were doing I, I didn't really want to get into this. We did to save my biological scientist sanity, we switched from manure to fertilizer in 2021. Those first two years that we were applying manure, we were doing, we were aiming at a matched rate. So we were thinking about grass production, and then we were um, basically estimating the amount that would be flowing through grazing livestock. Um, of course, very mean field kind of thing, because we we're applying it very uniformly in a small plot. But the goal was to kind of match it to what we'd expect. 
All right. I'm going to ask one last question. It'll be my own. So I think it's interesting when you're incorporating this peanut into your Bahia grass systems. I feel like a lot of the responses were not very dramatic when you added that into the system. Is that something you expected? I mean, I was sort of surprised to see that the mixed system often wasn't creating such a, a huge shift. Yeah. So the Basically, yeah, we were we were expecting to see a bit more impact of the legume incorporation. Um, some other folks have seen, um, you know, uh, increases in soil organic matter uh, with with legume sowing. And again, that's where I, I don't know so much. Like, are these plots unique in some sense? Like, are we too close to some sort of saturation, regardless of where that dynamic is coming from? Um, yeah, I really don't know fr from that point of view. Um, yeah, there's a ton of other data we have from these plots, but I don't want to get into that with a few seconds. All right. Well, uh, it is 12 o'clock, so we will let Chris take a break, uh, but he will be around for lunch and happy hour for those of you who want to keep asking him questions. And uh, other than that, thanks so much. And please join us next week for our next Thursday seminar. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.